Okay, hi. Um, my name is Louis. I'm a math undergrad from Laval University in Quebec, Canada. And this talk is about uh, the implementation of a simple system for uh, deadlock detection using dynamic analysis. It's a library-based approach. So um, I'm just a student. If you have any comments, I'm always trying to improve. So go ahead. And you can also ask your questions while I'm, uh, during the presentation. So first of all, um, I'll clearly define what is the subset of deadlocks that we're trying to, uh, to detect. Because deadlocks are a very broad class of problems. And we're only interested in tackling a small subset of these. So I'll define this clearly. Uh, then I'll also present existing solutions to the same problem. So you can see the, um, the trade-offs. And uh, then I'll present the library-based approach that I've come up with. Um, this will be split into three main points. First, I'll present how to use the library from existing code. Uh, which will also give you a glimpse at the design of the library. Um, then I'll present very briefly the algorithm that's used internally to detect the deadlocks. And uh, then I'll present a roadmap of what's to come in the future for the project. And finally, if we have time, um, finally, if we have time, we will uh, discuss about a generalization of the project into a more general purpose dynamic analysis library for C++. OK, so the type of deadlocks that we're interested in are uh, what's called lock order inconsistencies. They're like the most basic deadlocks involving mutexes. Uh, so the basic principle is that you have several threads and several synchronization objects. And in some thread, you, lock some you acquire some synchronization objects in, in some order. And in, in a different thread, you acquire the same synchronization objects, but in a different order. So the um, basic instance of, of uh, this deadlock is you have two threads. And somehow, um, <coughs> the first thread acquires A. And then the second thread acquires B. Um, if your program is in that state, then the first thread will be waiting after the second thread. And the second thread will be waiting after the first thread. This is a deadlock. The same principle goes for any number of threads. But um, it can get very hard to, uh, to detect for the programmer because if you have like business logic and other locks that are not involved in the deadlock all mixed together, it can be uh, very hard to detect. <coughs> so yeah, it's really the same thing, but harder to catch. Clearly. We could do better and have some kind of automa automatic way of detecting these. OK, why are they so vicious? But, well, the, the, the basic problem is that they're non-deterministic. And the corollary is that uh, it, it, unit tests won't really find them. Well, they might, they might find like the, the most basic deadlocks, but rare deadlocks won't happen because the shred scheduling conditions won't really change from one run of the, your unit test to another. So they won't be triggered. And well, they're difficult to reproduce and debug. So clearly, we would like to detect them automatically and before they happen. And this is <laughs> bad resolution. So, OK. I think that will work if everybody can, can see. Is it all right? OK, great. So well, no, that's, that's better. OK, um, I think we're, we'll be all right. So existing solutions. Well. First solution, <coughs> never hold more than one lock at once. Well, it's not really, well, it's not realistic for non-trivial programs. It will work, but it's not realistic. We could also determine a hierarchy among locks and always uh, acquire the synchronization objects in the same order. But, well, th this is a basic principle that we should always follow, but it's very hard to enforce for uh, non-trivial programs. So we'd like some tool to help us with it. Uh, we could also use a tool to distort the thread scheduling and then run the program several times. And um, that would trigger like hidden deadlocks. But well, it requires uh, running the, the, the program several times, which is, a, which is quite unwieldy. Uh, but all in all, it's a, it's a good idea. And it could be mixed with other approaches. Um, another possibility is to use uh, an algorithm to break deadlocks at runtime when they happen. But this has several drawbacks. Well, first of um, there can be like uh, non-negligible overhead um, that's incurred by using such an algorithm because it typically uh, involves updating a graph each time that a lock is acquired, and this is this is pretty. This can be a, a large overhead, and also the policy for breaking the deadlocks can't really be more clever than you are, and you're more likely to say, "Well, just break the thread, uh, just kill the thread. I, I have no idea what to do else." So uh, it's not really elegant. And finally, I think that it's kind of missing the point because uh, deadlocks are a bug and they shouldn't get into production. So um, they're not a runtime mishap that we should try to break at runtime. Um, a more viable alternative is Intel Inspector XE. 
Um, this is a tool, well, made by Intel. Um, it has a nice integration into Visual Studio, but the, from the specs, I can tell that uh, they only detect deadlocks up to four threads, which is uh, a bit of a bummer. Yeah. Um, okay, so the comment is that um, Bryce used it, uh, and uh, he's fairly sure that it detects deadlock for, uh, up to more than four threads. Well, on the website, um, the spec says that it's only up to four threads on the latest version. I, I'm really sure I checked. And so, uh, yeah, and there is a very uh, large overhead uh, from using it, and th it's proprietary and costly licensed, so it's not a viable alternative for, let's say, me, I'm a student, I have no resources, so. Uh, it, it's not really an, an alternative, and for some open source projects also uh, it might not be very good. And well, it's hard to uh, say exactly what it's capable of doing, like what types of deadlock it detects because it's not, it's not written. And finally, uh, an open source alternative is uh, Hellgrind, which is like a sub-component uh, of, of Valgrind. Um, and it's, a, it's pretty nice, but uh, a problem is that it runs your program on a virtual processor and uh, on a single thread, which could maybe like disturb a lot the, the, the behavior of your program and it, obviously there's a lot of overhead also and uh, it's limited to synchronization primitives based on the POSIX thread API. So we would like to have something that that is portable and that is uh, that runs where regardless of the platform you're, in, you're on. So D2 uh, stands for deadlock detector and uh, it's a library based approach. It has some uh, advantages and obviously some drawbacks. And that's what I present. Uh, is it all right up to now? Any questions, comments? Right. So the goals <coughs> are, to deadlock, uh, are to detect deadlocks, uh, well, lock ordering consistency deadlocks between any number of threads. Uh, and it should be able to support custom synchronization objects very easily. Uh, for example, if you have your spin mutex that, like an in-house spin mutex that's built uh, upon uh, atomic operations, well, it should be almost trivial to, uh, to detect deadlocks involving these, these uh, synchronization primitives, uh, which is, which is uh, something that uh, I couldn't find in any other tool. And uh, yes, and there should be a low overhead when enabled, and obviously no uh, overhead at all when the framework is disabled, which goes with the philosophy of C++. I must say that right now, the low overhead when enabled is not quite met. Uh, because the implementation is a bit, um, is a bit naive, but uh, we could do much better. Uh, and that will come in the next days or weeks. And we work very, very hard to, uh, to, um, to remove false positives. Uh, actually, it's probably the, it's a bit cocky to say this, but it's probably uh, the algorithm that's a little naive regarding, uh, regarding uh, in regard to, the, to, to false positives. Okay, and why intrusive? This is just like a very small rationale for why you have to modify your code. Basically, it's because it's much easier to implement. This is like the, 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 the real reason, but we could uh, create a wrapper over, it, over the project so that uh, it, your code is instrumented automatically, but right now it's not, um, it's, it's not, it doesn't exist. Okay, so how to use the library from existing code. So, well, just before I, I, start, I start this, um, the basic principle is that you'll instrument your code so that you, so you just have to modify a bit your code and then it will generate some events, okay? And then uh, it will generate four types of events. Whenever a luck is acquired or a luck is, re is uh, released, it generates an event. So it says to D2, hey, I was just acquired by this thread, and so on. And whenever a thread is started or joined, uh, it does the same thing. And then D2 gets, uh, gets this event, these events and it, uh, it records some data in some files somewhere on your file system. And then once your program has stopped running, once your, your run is finished, uh, you can use a, a command line utility to load the data uh, and perform an analysis and then you get, um, and then you get a, a diagnostic of like the potential deadlocks that could have happened during that run of the program, but that didn't because of the thread scheduling conditions. So it really takes the non-deterministic part of the, the deadlock problem and throws it away. So your, uh, the code path that your uh, program took during when, when you run the program with D2, is guaranteed to be deadlock free. If I made my job right. Okay, so yeah, it needs to record four types of, uh, of, of events. So in order to uh, instrument your code easily, hopefully, um, 
there is a high-level concept-based uh, API that's based on the concept from Bootstrap. Is um, anyone not familiar with, with this concept? Okay, so, uh, well, I, I, very fast. Basic lockable is any object that has a lock and an unlock method. Um, lockable is a basic lockable with a try lock method returning a Boolean. Uh, that means whether uh, the acquirer has succeeded. And the timed lockable is a lockable uh, with a try lock for some time duration and a try lock until some time point that does the obvious. So any synchronization primitive that respect, uh, that models any of these concepts will be trivial to, uh, to, uh, to track with D2. So all you have to do, okay, so let's say this is like um, on tracks mutex, this is the original implementation of your synchronization primitive. So uh, this, this synchronization primitive on, is only a model of the uh, basic lockable concept. So you just have to, let's say you change the name and then you type, you use, you wrap it using the D2 basic lockable wrapper and and then your, um, your, uh, all the rest of your code should be, should be as is. But whenever the lock method will be called, or the unlock method will be called, um, D2 will be notified. So it, it's pretty basic. We are using C++ element features, we forward the constructor, and so on. Uh, now, if, if it was like a model of the, of the, if it had like a try lock method, so it will model the lockable con concept, well, you would want to, uh, to wrap it in D2 lockable instead. And the same thing for uh, D2 uh, time lockable. Now, all the wrappers have a recursive counterpart for recursive locks. So it's also possible to track them. <coughs> and it's also possible to bypass a concept-based API if you have uh, synchronization primitives that do not model these, uh, these concepts. So um, you just have to inherit from D2 trackable sync object. And um, D2 trackable sync object uh, takes a template uh, a, a template parameter uh, that represents well whether the lock is recursive or non-recursive. So you have D2 recursive and D2 non-recursive, and <coughs> um, it provides the notify lock and notify unlock method. You just call them whenever your synchronization object is acquired. So it's a bit harder, but it's still but it's still not not, not too bad. Is it all right to know? Yeah. Now, tracking standard conforming threads is also kind of trivial. You just have to uh, wrap them into a D2 standard thread, which is uh, analogous to, uh, to the D2 lockable and so on. Um, tracking non-standard thread implementation is possible, but it's more of a pain. Um, first of whatever is the, uh, well, yeah, first of you have to inherit from D2 trackable thread. And um, Whenever, when, whatever is the method that you use for starting your thread, so it could be in the constructor like standard thread, or it could be like a start method. I've seen this in some existing code. Uh, you have to wrap the uh, the function that's going to be called in a, in a new thread with the D2 uh, thread function wrapper. Uh, basically, what it does is that when it's created, it assumes that it's in the parent thread, and when it's called, it assumes that it's in the child thread. So uh, it can generate like the event saying to D2. Um, the parent thread just started that child thread. So that's it. And also, whenever you're joined, you have to call the notify join method, method of that D2 trackable thread. And same thing when you're detached. So it's not too hard, but, um, but we don't have like, a better way of doing it right now if you're not a model of uh, um, the standard thread. And unfortunately, it, uh, because because trackable thread carries important state, you have to modify. Like it's like if you had uh, added a new member, so you have to take care of it. Uh, you will have very bad surprises if you don't. And there's also a low-level API that you shouldn't use, but uh, I'm just showing it because um, I, w I would eventually like to create bindings into other languages. Uh, for example, uh, Python and, and Ruby have very strong support for um, introspection, so it would be very easy to, uh, we could uh, instrument code like non-intrusively, which would be very nice. So for this, um, a low-level API that, that allows the, the library to be controlled like that is, uh, is necessary. All right? Okay, so like I said, it might be a bit small, but um, like I said, um, the events are generated and then they're saved into uh, some files somewhere on the file system. And uh, so this is a bit how it looks. It's pretty simple. Um, 
there's one file per thread, and each thread records the events that happened in that thread. And uh, there's also uh, one global file that's global to the program, I mean, um, and that records all the start and join events. Um, so let's see how it looks inside one of these files. So it's not pretty, but, but it's not meant for you to read anyway, so it's all right. Uh, right now, I use boost serialization to serialize the, the, the data. And then you just have to um, use the command line utility that's provided with the library uh, to load, to load the, the data. And basically, the output is a diagnostic of the potential deadlocks, like I said. So the format is, uh, it gives you the state of your program in which your program is deadlocked. So it has like a list of threads. And each thread, for each thread, it gives you a list of the synchronization object that it currently holds and the log that it's trying to hold, uh, the, to, uh, to acquire, but that it, it can't because it's waiting for some other thread. So hopefully you see that you have some thread holding these logs and waiting for that log, and that other thread holding these logs and then waiting for that other log, and you can see the, the cycle. And each location is a complete call stack. So uh, because without call stack, obviously, it's completely uh, irrelevant. Uh, now, right now, the output is not as nicely formatted as that, um, but uh, it's a work in progress. And the thread starts have no location information for now, but all the acquires have them. So uh, it, it just uh, there's no like a, there's no like um, it's just a matter of time uh, before I do it because there's no like a huge problem. I'm going to be able to do it very fairly easily. Okay. So the algorithm, uh, is it all right up to now? Yep. It's not very complicated. Yeah. So in the output, does it just give you the, the thread amount, the thread ID, uh, and help them block, and then another thread ID? OK, so the question is, uh, in the output, does it only give you the, the, um, the, 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 the thread ID? Is that it? Yeah. Um, right now, yes. It only gives you the, thread ID, the ID of the thread. OK. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to add also the, the information about when, where in, in the code that thread was started. And I mean, if, if you guys can think of some information that would be useful, seriously, just say it and uh, uh, I'll try to see if I can add it because the goal is really to, to make something that can be used by the community. So um, yeah, okay, so the algorithm. I'll go very, very um, high level and fast. I'll just give a summary because uh, this is only a 45 minute presentation. So uh, I'll skip to the, um, yeah, well, so just a disclaimer to make things very clear. I'm not, I'm not the author of the algorithm. I implemented it, but uh, it's presented in a paper, this paper. So I just want to make uh, things very clear. And um, yes, I have something like 60 slides or so explaining much in depth the algorithm. So if you're interested, you can uh, go get the, um, the slides there. Everything is on GitHub. Uh, and actually, you can also go to uh, ldion.com and then slash d2 d2 uh, cpp now 2013 uh, everything is there it's it's running on a server the presentation so um, you, you can you can go there and get the slides or you can read the original paper or talk to me offline after the presentation I'll be very glad to explain it to you it's not so complicated so let's skip to the to the summary of the algorithm right okay the basic principle is that we have a graph that's called the log graph okay there which is a directed multigraph. Is everybody um, OK with this? So a multigraph, you can have several parallel edges between two, two vertices. And each vertex of the log graph represents a, synchron a synchronization object. And an edge from u to v, u to v are vertices, uh, means that a thread acquired v while, while it was holding u. Okay? And then if you have a cycle in that log graph, it means that you have a deadlock. And what we're going to do to filter out false positives is that we're going to add some information on each on all the edges of, of the log graph and uh, filter out cycles that, that have some special properties that we know represent um, false positives. This is the basic principle. And so we also have a segmentation graph, which is only useful for reducing the false positives. Okay? And uh, basically, it's a directed acyclic graph uh, in which vertices represent segments of code that are separated by start and joins. And um, a path from U to V means that the segment of code represented by U has to be, uh, has to happen before this, the, the segment represented by V. 
So for example, if I have a thread, T1, and then I start it and then I join it, there's a code segment inside T1, okay? We have a segment, let's say U, inside T1. Then I start the thread at thread T2 and then join it. There's also a code segment inside T2. Well, since thread 2 was started after thread 1 was joined, it always has to, to, to run after thread 1. They can never run at the same time. So there will be uh, two segments, U and V, and a path from U to V in the segmentation graph. Is everybody all right with this? Okay, great. And so uh, all the details are explained in the other slides that I, sk I skipped, but this is like the general idea. And we label each edge of the log graph. Each edge represents like an acquire, like I said earlier. So we, uh, we label each, thread, uh, each edge of the log graph with the thread that performed that acquire, and also the set of logs that are held by the, the, the thread at that time. We'll call this gate logs. I'll be referring to it uh, like that later. And uh, the code segment in which the thread is, uh, performs the acquire also. So these are like the three main informations that we, uh, we, uh, we, label on, on that we label the edges with. And then we find all the cycles using a fancy algorithm, uh, not so fancy actually. And we, uh, we ignore a cycle, so we ignore a deadlock because it's a false positive, if any two edges are in the same thread. That represents a situation like that where you have a cycle, that is you have a local ordering inconsistency because a thread acquired A and then B and then another thread, or we think it's another thread acquired B and then A. But if they're actually the same thread, it means that it's not a deadlock because it, the lock ordering consistency happens inside the same thread. Yep. Yes, yes, this, okay, uh, well the comment was that this could be under different, in a different context, this could represent a potential deadlock. Well, the answer is that, oh yeah, and that would be useful to uh, have a, like a warning that you have, you, you might have a potential deadlock, yes. Um, well, there's currently an, an issue actually that I, I filled on the GitHub project saying that we should report uh, potential deadlocks or like warnings in these situations. So yes, uh, it's incoming, uh, but also I'd like to say that <coughs> It, it's, it's not a potential dead, well, it, it could be a potential deadlock depending on, I mean that whatever the thread scheduling is, the real thread scheduling is, you won't get a deadlock. But if your, uh, your like custom, your, your custom uh, task scheduler um, decides to, um, okay, what I mean is that like the, the, the threads from the system won't, can't make this into a deadlock. But, but maybe like your, your custom, uh, custom task scheduler can, yeah. But, uh, so yeah, we, we will uh, eventually give a warning for this. Then if any two edges uh, share, share uh, well, have, have common gate locks. So basically if the intersection of their gate lock set uh, is, not, is not empty, uh, it means that in order to have that deadlock, that both threads must be, um, must be holding the same locks, which is impossible so the deadlock can happen. Is it? Everybody all right with it? Okay. And finally, uh, if any edge happens in a segment that happens any other edge, well, it means that basically one segment has to run before another segment, and so the deadlock can't happen. For example, thread one, uh, like the, the lock ordering inconsistency, can't never, can never generate a deadlock because thread one will always be uh, executed before, strictly before before thread two because of because it's joined before thread two is even started. So we filter out these false positives. And I also have an ID that's not implemented right now. Um, that was not also presented in the paper. But uh, it's to inherit gate locks uh, from a parent thread to a child thread. Um, but only get gate locks that are held during the whole lifetime of the child thread. Because uh, well I have test uh, test case right now showing that we report false positive for these. So this, uh, this, uh, this eventually will be added to. 
OK, so uh, is everybody OK with the algorithm? What I'd like you to, uh, to remember is, is pretty basic. Uh, it's just uh, we, we create a graph, find cycles in it, then put a, a bunch of stuff on, on the edges and filter out what are false positives. OK, so there are several limitations and drawbacks to, to, to the approach, but mainly it, it, it uh, requires modifying existing code, which is a bit of a bummer, but um, it will be possible to to, uh, to, to create like a, a wrapper, let's say an extension to Clang that um, that, uh, that instruments your code automatically, it would be possible. And there is also no integration with an IDE uh, because it's a library-based approach. Um, for example, like I said, um, Intel in Inspector has a very nice integration with Visual Studio, but we can't have this. And so the roadmap, uh, what I'd like in the near future, like this summer, um, is to support a wider set of synchronization primitives, such as um, sorry, um, condition variables or um, semaphores, read-write locks, upgradable locks, and name it. So it, it's all possible. Um, they won't. They won't all be uh, like. They won't all generate potential lock ordering inconsistency deadlocks. Maybe like all other types of deadlocks, but it's all possible to uh, to, to to find them. And yes, provide pre-written integration with some existing libraries. For example, it would be very nice to be able to just um, patch boost, thread, or patch, uh, patch TBB, and then uh, rebuild your project and get, the, uh, get the, uh, the deadlock detection for free. That would be nice. And it's cur currently there is a patch that's almost working, a patch for, for boost thread. Uh, so it, it's pretty near. And also, I'd like to further, yes? Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. I, I didn't know that actually. Okay. Well, the comment is that um, Intel Inspector already has an API that you can so you can uh, instrument your own like custom synchronization objects. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, I guess then uh, we're falling back to the fact that it's proprietary and also that it only uh, detected like um, up to four threads. Okay. Okay, okay, yes, I get it now. Okay, yes. Okay, so um, now I have time for it, yes. Uh, um, how much time left? Okay, great. Um, so I'll be going through, uh, uh, I'd like to discuss a bit about like a generalization of the, of the project into a um, general purpose dynamic analysis uh, framework. Um, it's, it's pretty experimental, so um, we won't go so much in depth. Some of it, like I'll show you code, some of it works right now, some of it don't, doesn't work. It's still at, like a bit at the design stage. It's still uh, a bit at the testing stage also, but um, I'm developing this like in parallel with D2 because um, what I'm trying to do with Dino is to uh, factor all the code that's generic to dynamic analysis into a separate library and then just have D2 use that that dynamic analysis library to perform the custom uh, like deadlock analysis. So ideally, ideally, um, th the goal would be to uh, to only have like graph analysis code in D2 and also like the definition of what is the information that I need to pull out of the program and all the rest of the logic sh should be in, in, in Dino. <clears throat> so the idea is to have a library that um, allows you to generate, well, to define events that can be generated by a program. Um, for, for D2, the events will be, so acquire, release, start, and join. It's, it's pretty basic. You can also bind custom action, actions to these events, uh, a bit like in JavaScript. Um, and then uh, there will be an API also for loading events from a custom source or, well, saving events, obviously, to a custom sync uh, so that you can perform your analysis very easily offline. Fine. I mean, well, after the program has finished running. Uh, because, yeah, um, the whole thing of, anali uh, of performing the analysis after the program has finished running allows us to, to be much more efficient and to um, incur a, a, a smaller overhead on, on the overall program. That's why we're doing it that way. Yes, okay. So we define an event. Um, just l look at it as if it were pseudocode, okay? 
Um, basically, we're defining it in very like general terms. Uh, very, it's it's really declarative, and the goal of this is to to uh, to uh, say to, to to Dino like, okay, I'd like this information to be available when when this event is generated. I'd like also to be to have this information and also, for example, this custom information that will be referred to with tags colon colon lock ID, and the, the type of this information is, information is uh, unsigned, and so that will allow that will allow um, Dino to perform aggressive optimizations on how is the event actually represented. And this is the goal. So for example, an event wouldn't really contain the whole call stack. It will, I mean, like reference it somewhere and maybe like a, a catch it for access and what, you get the point, the ID. And then you bundle the events into a framework. So you basically, uh, yeah, so you bundle the different types of events. So this is how we would do for D2. And you also specify a backend in which you will save and load the events. So right now, it will be saved on the file system. It's a pretty simple class, but it could be also like send them over the wire. And then you instantiate your, your uh, framework. And all, uh, all interaction <coughs> with the framework will, will pass through uh, the D2 framework. OK, and so you can <coughs> bind actions to events as you want. So um, whenever, whenever an event that's tag, that is uh, like associated to the tags colon colon acquire tag, uh, whenever such an event is generated in D2 framework, well, um, your lambda will be, will be uh, called. Right now, uh, this example isn't really great because actually, like I said, you don't know the real representation of the event because we want to do like aggressive optimizations. So um, that will require something like, like um, um, C++14 uh, auto lambda or something like that because you have no clue what is the, the actual type of the event. This is the goal. It, just to give you, like, to make it more concrete, it's going to be something like a, um, that looks like a, a fusion map for those who are uh, uh, familiar with, the, with the, the ID. And so you can generate uh, different events very easily. You can provide, like, uh, I pr so I provide the, the lock ID, which is the custom information when I declare my event, I said you're going to have a lock ID, which is of type unsigned. So I'm providing it when I generate the, the event in D2. And so on that line, your uh, lambda would be called, and then the event will be serialized somewhere in a file. And finally, it's uh, possible, well, it should be very easy to, um, to, load, to load events from a custom source to perform, only, uh, to perform your custom analysis so that you really factor like, all the code that you need for your analysis into you really factor it out of the rest of the logic. So uh, this would um, this pattern, if I may, um, is a bit like the static visitor pattern from uh, from when you use boost variant. So you can load like a sequence of heterogeneous events and do whatever you want when when you get an, an event. And um, so for D two, for example, whenever there's an acquire event that's generated, uh, we would um, we would add an edge with some information on the log graph. When there's a release event, we, we wouldn't do much. And when uh, we encounter any other event, we, we don't do anything. And so the use cases are uh, f f for Dino are really like, first of simpli simplifying D2's implementation, which is the reason why I started it. And uh, then we could also maybe like benchmark memory allocations, check them. And uh, just in general, if we can be uh, performant enough, it, would, it, it could evolve. Um, it could evolve in a, in a more general, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing the word, um, benchmarking library uh, for a profiling purpose. So uh, this is it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any comments or questions, I'll be uh, happy to uh, answer them to the best of my knowledge. Yes? Okay, so the question is: uh, so the question is, uh, is there a, a, an easy way to, to disable the framework? Um, uh, because if so, it's not such a problem that it's intrusive. Uh, yes, um, if basi by default it's, it's, it's disabled. Okay, so uh, no, well, if I did my work uh, right, uh, if if you like, if you use the type defs and like, I sh if you um, 
use the, the library with your code, nothing is changed in your program normally. Then, if you re rebuild and define v2 underscore enabled, all in caps, uh, well, then you get the, the, the locking code. And then, when d2 is enabled statically, okay, so no overhead when it's disabled. And then, w when it's enabled, um, you have to set an, env an environment variable that's gonna, s that's gonna point to the path, the path uh, where, um, the, where the library should save the, the, the events. And if it's not, if there is no, uh, th there's no um, path that, that's, uh, that's provided, well, uh, then all the calls are basically one atomic check. And that's it. Yes. Okay, yes, um, so the comment is, um, would it be possible to implement some kind of, um, some kind of mechanism that when you, when you detect a deadlock, you, um, when you detect a deadlock, you, you, you have some kind of, um, of way of handling it, and uh, yes, it's definitely possible. Um, it goes a little bit like the, 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 in the, it's a bit like using an algorithm for detecting the deadlocks, like, like I talked about earlier. But uh, I, I think that it could be used for, um, for um, like, if you run your program and there is a deadlock in that run of the program, when the, the library won't like explode or your program, so so you will, so you will handle it and say, okay, well, we were trying to detect potential deadlock. We had an actual deadlock. Here it is. But, but yeah, it's possible to do basically anything you want. Um, if if you uh, integrate like like if you uh, give the um, the required information to D2, well then I can implement any algorithm on top of that. Yeah, so we could definitely have some kind of uh, of, of checker that runs in a different thread, and that like updates a graph live and that breaks your deadlock, whatever you want. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no uh, more questions, thank you.